welcome and happy new year to all of you. And uh, I want to welcome you all back for the spring 2014 semester, even though it doesn't really feel much like spring, does it? And I, I congratulate you for braving uh, the weather and making your way over here today. And I know there's several, a number of people from across campus that are probably watching this online. And <clears throat> when I think back about what I talked about last, uh, my last plenary, I think the title of the talk was Our Path Forward. And today I'm really going to be giving a number of updates about the things that have happened since I last addressed you, because we really are making strides along that path. And there are several big announcements that have occurred, and I think maybe none more uh, greater than uh, the fact that I have a new boss. Uh, Ray Cross was announced as the president of the UW system about two weeks ago, right here on our campus. And I do think it's very symbolic that Ray chose to be introduced in Milwaukee rather than Madison, because I believe that Ray understands the importance of Milwaukee to the future of the state of Wisconsin. And in fact, when he gave his very first interview right after the announcement happened to the Journal Sentinel, his quote in the paper said, we need to bring the resources of the university to help UWM address the challenges this region faces. If we can impact the problems of Milwaukee, we can impact the problems of the whole state. So I'm very excited to work with President Cross to bring new resources to this campus so that we can make a greater impact on the state of Wisconsin and its residents. There's also two members of my cabinet uh, that have come on board since I last addressed you. The interim title of Vice Chancellor Robin Van Harpen has been removed, and we just last week introduced Bob Beck as our new CIO. Now, these two individuals have a proven track record on our campus and more than 27 years combined experience. I believe that this experience will be vital for us as they provide visionary leadership to help us through our future challenges. Now, I've been chancellor for three years, and I've been talking about all the capital projects that are undergoing on our campus. The total number is over $300 billion today we're working on. Well, it's very exciting that last semester and this coming semester, many of those projects have either come online or will be coming online to really provide us a chance to reach our vision of being a top-tier research university, because we have facilities that will allow us to be more successful. Uh, one of the projects I want to start with today is the Global Water Center. Now, <clears throat> we did the grand opening for the Global Water Center back in September, and UWM is the anchor and the largest tenant in that space. We have faculty doing translational research around water, but this location truly is a partnership opportunity for us, because not only are we located there, but Badger Meter, A.O. Smith, Veolia, a number of startup companies provide great collaboration opportunities for our faculty and students to be successful. I often refer to this project as not only transformational for UWM, but I believe it will transform the fifth ward of Milwaukee, and we'll see great changes there. In addition, it will allow Milwaukee to be better positioned to be a global leader in water. Now, when I think about the Global Water Center and the impact that it can make, not only here locally, but around the world, I like to refer to a story um, of something that occurred to me uh, last semester. Now, some of you know I have office hours for students, and it's a couple days a month. And last fall, I had a student named Alice Cones come to see me. She'd heard about the Global Water Center, she'd heard about our School of Freshwater Science, and she comes from Kenya. And she said to me, 56% of our population do not have access to clean, fresh drinking water. Is there any way UWM can help the people of my country, particularly the village where I grew up, because she described her experience as a child and young adult of having to hike 15 kilometers a day to a river to bring back fresh drinking water for her fellow villagers. She had to miss school. The walk was not always safe. So clearly, I said, I'll do anything I can to help. And she said, I have access to some of the government officials in Kenya is there any way we can bring a delegation over and we can talk about what we might be able to solve this problem? So I said, sure. And in mid-November, the delegation came over. And I pulled together, not only Alice, but <clears throat> College of Engineering Applied Science, Wilka Star Antieno, who's a Kenyan native, was also there. Dean David Garman and Eric Leaf from our School of Freshwater Science. And Dean Amhouse from the Water Council got in a room together. And we talked for 45 minutes about a potential solution 
and I was amazed that we were able to develop one. It was fairly simple and straightforward. The idea was we would capture the water from the village's largest building, which is the school, store it in a cistern, and then Dean Garman described how we could build filtration systems out of natural materials for about $3,000 that would help provide drinking water for the 10,000 residents of the village. Now this system will have far-reaching impacts on the village. Not only will it allow the women and children to go to school and be educated, as it turns out, our students from the School of Freshwater Science will be able to go over to the village and help them build these filtration systems and then they can become a business model that they can go sell them to other villages to help really with the economic development of the community. And finally, the system is located at a school. So it represents a great educational opportunity for the children of the village. Now, as I walked away from that meeting, I couldn't be more excited because I thought, look at how the faculty and students of our campus are gonna be able to solve a problem and change the lives of people across the world that has been struggling with something like this for centuries. And so the best way I put it, when I think about the Global Water Center and what it means, we can say that Kenya came to Milwaukee and to UWM to solve their water problems. That is truly transformational. Speaking of transformational, if any of you have been out in Mabatosa near the old county grounds, you know that that area is transforming around our development. In fact, back in November, we opened a road, a ribbon cutting for road for the new uh, Discovery Parkway that cuts right through the heart of our innovation campus. Our first building will be opening up in March, our innovation accelerator. Not only will we be having 10 faculty uh, from our university moving out there to do translational uh, research, but the facility will also have fabrication facilities located that are not available anywhere else in the state of Wisconsin. Our first corporate partner, ABB, their building will be done in June. This facility will house 350 employees, primarily doing research and development. There will be our partnership. There's other developments. We have well, groundbreaking will happen this spring for an extended stay hotel. Residential housing will start. And clearly, uh, this landscape is being transformed. Our School of Freshwater Sciences if you've not been down on Greenfield Avenue lately, the whole exterior shell of the building is done. The building is transforming the skyline of Milwaukee's Inner Harbor. I'm very excited because I've been told that hard hat tours will begin in the new facility starting on February 1st and expected that the building will be completed by April. When completed, this building will provide our faculty and students state-of-the-art facilities that are not located anywhere else in the country. Just across campus, if you look at the Kenwood IRC, it's very exciting to see what's going on as that building is coming to life. It should be done sometime next winter and will provide a new house for our nationally ranked physics department along with providing core facilities for science, engineering, and our public health researchers. We had two major developments come, come about uh, recently in the Northwest Quad. Now I often talk about the Northwest Quad as the canvas our campus is gonna paint on for the next decade. Now, <clears throat> it's very exciting for me to see the pictures on that canvas beginning to come to light. And the, the greenhouse in the Northwest Quad is one of those things. Now, if you're not familiar, we had two greenhouses as a campus, one by Lapham Hall, one by the School of Freshwater Sciences, uh, that we had to tear down due to other construction projects. Uh, just last month, we had the grand opening for this uh, greenhouse. It is a 9,200 square foot facility with 11 independent rooms with their own air handling filtration systems. We don't have to worry about cross pollinization. And unlike the other two facilities, which were one room and we couldn't control virtually anything in them, we can now control light, temperature, humidity, and CO2. There's not a better greenhouse in terms of capabilities in the country, and it's right here on our campus. It will serve more than 1,700 students a year, and it will allow us to produce species of plants that we couldn't even imagine previously. When we consider the impact of this greenhouse and what it means, the greenhouse manager, Paul Engelvold, 
said, we can design an environment that faculty want versus the faculty needing to design their research around the environmental conditions. And Jeff Karen at the grand opening mentioned to me, by simulating the change of seasons indoors, I can raise three generations of plants in the time I could previously only raise one. And he was very excited because he can now do research in the summer because the facility is fully air conditioned. Now, we've had a very successful bioscience uh, departments in recent years, bringing in over $4 million in research, federal research. Now we are going to have a facility that fits the scholarly potential of those researchers. The other very exciting facility coming that has come online <clears throat> is our Children's Learning Center. Now, our Children's Learning Center has been known as the best in the state for decades, but they have been operating in the old Kunkel Hall, which is an old school and facility that not really fit the needs of either the students, the children, or the faculty. Today, I'm very excited to say that on January 2nd, we opened the new learning center. And when I was in a tour there, even I wanted to stay to hear a story underneath <laughs> <laughs> the treehouse, which is located there. And we thought it was very appropriate today that our next Chancellor Spotlight video uh, is on the learning center, so you can see more about the space which they developed. I want to see over here. I'll show you. I like how we have more space. The tree house. The gym. <laughs> it's like big. It's really big. We've just grown and grown and grown and grown from a couple of classrooms to now 21 classrooms. I believe I started at six months. I've been here for, oh man, we're coming up on 16 years now. It's my dream job. <laughs> it really is. The only place I could think of that I would want to work, that I would really be happy working, was here. For me, it was like, it was like home. It puts into perspective how much they cared for us. That's a pretty important part of like a person's life is when they're learning everything and I was here and I'd like to credit <laughs> the center to who I've become, I, I think, <laughs> to a degree. The things that they are getting out of this program are going to stay with them for the rest of their lives. I think the fact that parents can bring their children here and leave knowing that they can go to work or go to class or go to do research and their child is absolutely well cared for brings a sense of accomplishment to the whole campus. One, two, three. As a student parent, it's really, really convenient because I have my classes in one building and my child is very close by. As a student in the field of education, it's like having an ongoing field placement because I'm always able to use some of those strategies that I'm learning and bring them here and practice them with children. To know that we have built a place where we provide the care and education that we believe children deserve, all children deserve, is what brings me to work every day. And to know that we can be a model of that for our students who are going to go on to be teachers. I definitely love the community aspect of it. It's just a great um, connection, being able to work and go to school and have your child all at the same place. Of course. The thing that I'm most proud of has nothing to do with the building. It has to do with the relationships that children and families and staff have with each other and we could be anywhere and have those relationships. There is a lot of love here, and in our old building, somebody had written on the walls when we had a graffiti opportunity, the happiest place on earth. And I'd like to make this the happiest place on earth, <laughs> a new happiest place on earth.
know the Children's Center is planning a, a grand opening for all of campus later semester, and so look forward to getting an invitation. I really encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to try to go over and, and see what special things are going on there. Okay. Okay, there's a lot been going on on campus uh, since I addressed you last, and all of you have been working very hard uh, about some major initiatives we have. And the academic planning process, led by Provost Brits, is actually... Um, well, this thing seems to have stopped working. Um, uh, <clears throat> the schools and colleges submitted their academic plans uh, back in December. And both Mark Monet and Provost Spritz have been very, um, working very, very hard and diligently about getting the, uh, the academic plans into one integrated plan for all of campus. Uh, I apologize. This is, seems to be a delay here. And uh, with the idea is that uh, the, strategic, the academic plan uh, which we have the first draft of, is now becoming uh, a part, an important part of the integration of our overall uh, strategic plan. And many of the schools and colleges uh, that have uh, been working on this actually have called the whole situation transformational. And I think uh, the best quote uh, comes from Dean Rodney Swain, which has talked about the actual process and said, over the past year, the academic planning process at UWM has fostered the broadest, deepest level of conversation about our academic future. It's not always been easy, but it's been worthwhile. I'm excited for our students. Great new courses and programs are on their way. So when we talk about strategic planning, uh, <clears throat> we, this process is really starting to accelerate now that the academic plan has come to completion. And <clears throat> this document is expected to be done in May, and it will guide our decisions as a campus through the year 2020. Now, in fall 2013, just last fall, we had more than 200 faculty and staff and students participate in 20 teams of different parts of strategic planning. And that did not include hundreds of other faculty, staff, and students that took part in open forums. The next open forum uh, is on February 5th at 3 o'clock in Sandburg Flicks. And you always have the opportunity to share your opinions about things about the strategic plan in the process at strategicplan.uwm.edu. As part of the strategic planning process, I've asked all of my direct reports to fill out transparent and accountable decision-making forms for any initiative that they're undertaking or any major initiative. The idea behind these forms is to show how initiatives we're doing on campus align with our vision and values, and also describes in a very transparent way for all of campus what's going to be done and who is responsible for that work. And finally, it also has quantifiable results to make sure we are making progress on those initiatives. I encourage all of you, if you're interested in seeing these forms for the people that directly report to me, to go to uh, uh, chancellor.uwm.edu where all of these forms are located. We are currently also still working on the budget model. Uh, coming up just next month, we have our next meeting of the budget model working group on February 6th. And the new model is expected to be completed this fiscal year. Now, I do want to emphasize that the new model will not create new revenue for campus, but rather it will provide incentives <coughs> that feed that's okay. Hopefully this won't work better. Provide incentives that lead to UWM, that are tied to the UWM strategic goals. Oh, this is better. Uh, another major initiative on our campus is being led by Vice Chancellor Joan Prince and a team of faculty, staff, and students to try to get us the Carnegie Classification for Community Engagement. Now this group is working very hard to finish the application before the deadline of April 15th. And the idea behind uh, the documents we're submitting is to show UWM's deep commitment to long-standing bi-directional partnerships and engagements with our community and our partners. And as a way to recognize the excellence that is going on, we have so many projects on our campus where we're engaged with the community and doing great things. We're actually going to have a new award called the Chancellor's Signature Partnership Award, which we're going to give out every year. Uh, the details of this will be forthcoming in, in the coming weeks, but I am very excited that we are going to be honored some of the great work that we're finding is going on on our campus. Now, we are still striving to be a better place to work, and even though we have challenges, 
we continue to get phenomenal nominations for best place to work champions. Over the last several months, uh, we've been able to highlight a number of people that you see behind me that have just made UWM a better work environment for all of us. And we really want to recognize that. Another thing we've kind of found of doing uh, through the Best Place to Work initiative is that climate is typically local. And so what we've done is we've all campus leadership of the units on campus to develop a Best Place to Work plan that they can share with their colleagues and talk about best practices and really help address things that may be local within their units. And speaking of excellence in terms of local units. I really want to highlight and, and recognize our College of Nursing and Dean Sally Lundeen for their efforts to foster a collegial and supportive work environment. For those of us who are directly involved with some of this can tell you the environment in the College of Nursing is second to none on our campus. Another major update which I'm sure all of you are interested in is that we are coming with a new email and calendar system for the campus. Now as it turns out Zimbra, who supports PantherLink, is not going to fully support it anymore, so we need to move in a different direction. So we actually charged a team uh, led by Jacques de Plusset. He performed, they performed an intensive several month long study about the top two systems available, Microsoft Office 365 and Google Apps for Education. Now the good news, uh, actually we had Jacques presented the report with some of his staff to the cabinet on Tuesday. And the good news is that both systems meet all of our campus needs. They both will be significantly less expensive than our current system, and they give us greater functionality. Now, I know there's a lot of interest in this, so you can actually get a summary of the report uh, at emailfuture.uwm.edu, and there's also a place there for you to provide comments about which system you might prefer. It's hard to believe, but we're already talking about 2015 2017 budget. Now before I talk about the future, I want to go one step back and again talk about our past because I can't emphasize enough, even though I sent out a message to campus, about the Legislative Audit Bureau's report that we got in November about our cash balances. Now as you may recall, our carry forward balances were $89 million last year. But of that $89 million, 90% were committed to our existing projects, which you see going up all around the city. 7% were overhead accounts supporting UWM research that were from federal grants. And 2%, or only $2.5 million, were true reserves. And to put that into context, we have a $700 million budget. So I've been very proactive, uh, actually, in the past several weeks, in meeting with people and telling the true story about our financial situation. I met with General Senator's editor, Representative Robin Voss, and actually, anyone who's willing to listen to me to articulate our UWM reserve balances. Now, I encourage you to do the same, to make sure people understand that we do not have large reserves on our campus. Uh, we had some good news from the state. Uh, the Le Legislative Fiscal Bureau uh, released their report that showed the revenue projections improved by over $900 million recently, just a week ago this came out. And so I just want to let all of you know that I am committed to lobbying the state to allocate some of these funds to the UW system, particularly to focus on faculty and staff compensation. Now, last time I was in front of you, I presented some disparity between the UW system campuses in terms of GPR and tuition allocation. Uh, this graphic I showed today was something that was produced by the UW system and shows the differences in allocation of uh, tuition GPR between Milwaukee and Madison. And <clears throat> since I was in front of you last, uh, we've, the UW system has had a mandate from the legislature to come up with a new transparent GPR and tuition allocation model. I lobbied to be on the uh, working group and actually was appointed to that group. And we had our first meeting in Madison last Friday. And based on that meeting, I am confident that we have a fair and equitable model for all the college campus developed this coming June. Now, a recurring theme in my last several plenaries refers to our enrollments because they present the biggest challenge facing our campus. So I have some updates in terms of the fall 2014 applications. Unfortunately, we are down 7%. But 
I'm here to tell you that we're not alone. There's not a single, as of January 1st, there's not a single campus in the UW system that has an increased number of applications compared to last year. Madison has no change by comparison. Eau Claire's down 9%, River Falls are down 4%, Green Bay's down 17%. Clearly, we're fighting an uphill battle in this state in terms of our applications and enrollment of incoming freshmen. Now, you also may recall at my plenary last time, I charged Interim Dean Barb Daly and Mark Money to help us develop a strategic enrollment plan that was comprehensive for all of campus. They have been very, very hard at work since last September when I gave them this charge. And I want to thank them for the great work they've done for this campus. Uh, one of the th most important things that they did is they went out and found two national enrollment experts, one from Platteville and one from Iowa State, which both campuses have seen huge enrollment growths over the last five years, and brought them in to our campus. And what they asked them to do is help us to analyze our enrollment practices and see where there are gaps and deviations from best practices. The consultants gave their final report uh, to Mark and Barb over the weekend, and they gave me the final report and their recommendations for moving forward just yesterday. I want to highlight some of these, uh, some of our weaknesses and some of the recommendations they provided. In terms of weaknesses, our enrollment efforts in academic affairs and student affairs were found to be siloed. And we look at best practices across the country, academic affairs and student affairs have to be completely and totally integrated. There was also a lack of communication and coordination across campus on the extensive recruiting efforts and retention efforts being made by many of the faculty and staff on this campus. And finally, we were told that UWM does not effectively use data and technology to make decisions about enrollment management. We are using previous trends rather than looking forward and helping use predictive modeling with the great data which we have available to us. So what are the recommendations? Well, by far the first and most important recommendation of the report was that I form a Chancellor's Council on Enrollment Management. In essence, I will lead a council that is charged with seamlessly integrating the efforts of the Student Association, Academic Affairs, University and Communications Departments on our campus. So far, we've formed a nine-member steering committee to make high-level decisions and develop a comprehensive management plan. Now, this steering committee consists of myself, Provost Britz, Vice Chancellor Liberty and Lujak, and five academic deans, uh, Dean Lundeen, Green Street, Smunt, Swain, and Maria G.J. from the uh, Graduate School. We are going to meet weekly starting on this coming Monday, and we're going to be updated on the work of several enrollment task force, and we're probably going to form some other ones to ensure that we are coordinated on our campus. Along with that work, uh, we are also, the council is also going to be finding a way to make strategic decisions that are data informed using data that we have available to us. Uh, some of the other uh, universities in the country, such as Georgia State, which use be best practices, take advantage of expertise of the faculty and staff on their campus to do the strategic enrollment management. We plan on doing the same. We also are going to coordinate an internal communication plan enabling greater coordination and cooperation across all areas of enrollment practices. And finally, we had a reorganization where we moved some of the enrollment services to different parts of the university. We're going to ensure that we're going to move beyond that reorganization so that we can have a positive momentum going forward. Finally, I want to rec recognize that I believe that enrollment management is everyone's job on our campus. And there was one statement in the consultant's report, they interviewed 20 some people on our campus, that really struck me and stood out. And I just want to highlight it to you, Jane, and tell you a little bit of a story about you know, what I think about it. So uh, somebody said that that part of enrollment is someone else's job. I don't touch that. And again, I believe that all aspects of enrollment should be all of our concerns, especially now when it's the most critical thing uh, looking at our future. And so <clears throat> I had an aha moment uh, on January day. I was at a party, and I. Uh, was talking to a senior from Marquette uh, University High School. 
And I asked him, well, what, what, was his, what were your plans for the future? He said, well, I want to major in computer science. And I said, well, what are you looking at? He says, well, I'm looking at MSOE and Platteville, uh, probably. And I said, well, you know, UWM has a great computer science department. And if you're interested in smaller class size and more personalized education, we have an honors college. You know, why don't you come over and we can show you, uh, you know, I'll give you, we'll get a personal tour for you to come take a look. I'm very happy to say that he's taken us up offer. He's going to be coming to campus. But coming out of that, I thought, you know, if every one of our faculty and staff on this campus recruited one student this year, our enrollment challenges would be eliminated. So I want to say to you, I challenge each of you to try to find one student when you're at parties, when you're out in the community, and try to get them to be interested in UWM. Because you can make, each of you can make a difference to the challenge that we're facing. Oh, in fact, um, I feel so strongly about this, that if you do recruit someone here, please email me and let me know. Because at the end of the year, I want to have a reception for anybody who's recruited somebody here, either at Chapman Hall or at the residence. Um, now, really, to help us uh, with our own recruiting efforts and to help us tell our story, um, the campus has developed a new social media tool. And uh, this really came about, uh, I was at a UC meeting, I believe it was last fall, when Lane Hall, on, who was a member of the UC, said to me, so Mike, why can't we use social media to better tell our story and recruit students to our campus? And so I went back to Tom Lujak and the University Relations and Communications Department. I said, what can we do? And I'm very proud to say that they stepped forward and developed a tool called hashtag Panther Proud that <clears throat> will allow us, with a single click of a button, to share stories about our campus on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media sites. Now, these stories are going to be emailed to us from the communications department that we can share with others. These are good stories about our campus. And when I think about the power of what this could mean, on average, each of us has about 100 different contacts on our social media sites. And when you consider that we have 5,000 faculty and staff on this campus, when a story comes out about UWM, if we all just share that with our social media sites, it will touch more than 500,000 individuals. We can make UWM go viral. Uh, finally, I've talked a, little, a lot about recruiting, but the other part of enrollment, obviously, is retention. And I want to share with you what I find to be an extremely inspirational story about something that happened on our campus earlier this year. Now, when we think about retention, our biggest challenge is our campus revolves around remedial math. 42% of our freshman class this year, it's always traditionally about 40, require, require remedial math. Now, when a student requires remedial math, they only have a 24% chance of graduating in six years. Clearly, this is a huge hurdle. So the math department rolled up their sleeves and led by math chair Kyle Swanson and said, we're going to do something about this. So this fall, they developed a pilot course, part of a math pathways program, and taught a course math 94 using completely new and innovative flipped classroom technique. Now, Math 94 is a one semester six credit course that covers the content of the former Math 90 and Math 95 in one semester. And so in the course, students would watch a YouTube video on the content before they came in. They would use class time to go over practice problems. And then they also did work on using an artificial intelligence software called Alex. And in this new format, the results were absolutely phenomenal. 84% of the students in the class got a C or better. And by using, you can track how often they watch the videos, how often they use Alex. And the students that did not pass the course spent 30 hours or less during the semester on the course. They either just didn't put the time in or they quit paying attention to it at all. So the students that put in the time passed. And what was really remarkable to me is that one quarter of the students that passed, because this is a self-paced course, then went on to try to complete Math 105 in the same semester. And of those students to try to complete Math 105, 83% scored a C or higher. And to put it into context, 
over 30, only 35% of students taking the traditional Math 90, 95 sequence will pass any GER math course on our campus. But probably what is the most remarkable, or thing that struck me the most, were the reviews of the students that were in the pilot course. One said, I have had math anxiety my, life, my whole life and dreaded taking mathematics. I now like mathematics and I'm not scared of it. I was shaking, crying, and stressed in the first exam. Your help and guidance allowed me to shed all of my anxieties and I am now getting A's. I never dreamed of getting A's in my math classes. My family is just stunned that I am now less anxious even in other domains of my life. And finally, I love that I can watch the video lectures many times and not feel stupid. So clearly, our campus, we continue to face significant challenges. But I think we also all have to look at the Math Pathways program as an example of how our, our faculty and staff can be extremely innovative and help us count tackle whatever challenges we face. Now in the last three years, I have stressed that we must adhere to our mission, vision, and values as we go out on this path and move forward. What I've described today, I think we really shows that we are doing that. When you think about our mission, and again going back to the math scholars, we are to provide an excellent education for citizens of the state of Wisconsin. We are really striving to do that. When you think of our vision to be a top-tier research university, we are bringing online buildings and projects that are going to allow us to take the next step along the research plan. And finally, we think about our values. The project I described in Kenya, we are not only changing lives of the residents of Wisconsin, but we are changing the lives of people around the world. Now in closing, I hope you're all proud of the things that we are accomplishing as a campus and you are accomplishing with such minimal resources. I certainly am very proud of you and I'm very proud of this great university. And we will always have obstacles to overcome, but clearly, if we work together, we will conquer them. Thank you. I think we're going to open up the floor for any questions people have. Um, yeah, I oh, thank you. Makes it better. Yeah, here's a microphone. Um, thank you for the uh, excellent plenary. Um, uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on the recent election or selection, not election, but selection for president at, at System. I personally feel that we dodged a major situation um, uh, by, that is, uh, between the three candidates, I think, personally, that the selection was a wise one. Uh, but I would like to hear your opinion and just what the implications are mm -hmm. to uh, UWM. Sure. And um, just for full disclosure, uh, Ray had asked me to be one of his references, and I'm very gladly obliged to do so. So that should tell you something about how I feel about the selection of the process. But if we go back two years ago, we started working very close. I, I personally started working very closely with Ray Cross. And what he said in the General Sentinel quote, he told me two years ago that the state, that Milwaukee is the solution to the state's problem and not the problem, and that the only way we're going to solve it is by bringing more resources to Milwaukee and particularly to UWM. So I think going forward, it's very, I think it's a very good thing that we have someone leading the system that understands the value of Milwaukee. And I, I will, I knew, we're not going to get a tremendous amount of new resources into the system, but if we do, I expect us to do pretty well on that. Yeah. Yeah. Chancellor, could, we're going into the second year of the budget, the biennial budget next year. Could you talk a little bit more specifically about where the campus is at and what we're going to do next year to make up for the cuts? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Specifically, the, the cuts, uh, I think, um, last fall, uh, so the first year of the biennium, much of the cut was taken 
both by UW system and by the campus centrally, so that we minimize the impact of this current year uh, of, of um, the biennium on the cuts we undergo. Going forward next year, we actually had to pass down, because we don't have any more money centrally to take it, systems not, doesn't have any more money, so it's going to the units uh, within the schools and colleges. And so we didn't, we essentially gave the schools and colleges what their cut was gonna be, and we're not micromanaging on how they are actually gonna implement them. But I will tell you, uh, next year, in, in my opinion, may be the most difficult year fiscally you know, since I've been in Milwaukee uh, because of those cuts. Now, the good news is uh, what I'm hearing, you know, I know we might have one really hard year. I'm hearing that there, there's a good likelihood that they are gonna restore the $181 million investment they were talking about making before we had the whole surplus thing blow up on us. And so, you know, maybe it's gonna be one very difficult year, uh, but I do believe that hopefully we will see new investments for the first time in the system uh, in the next annual budget, 215, 217. I was wondering, with respect to the enrollment issue and having a steering committee to look into all of these issues of strategic planning and so forth, whether it would be a good idea to have some faculty on that committee. Because mm -hmm. uh, you're asking all the faculty and everyone else to go recruit students, and um, it seems to me that uh, they would have some good ideas about sort of the content of the message. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a great point, Dave, and I think I, I probably didn't make it clear. So there's gonna be a council for in, in, um, enrollment management, and there's a steering committee that's part of that council. So we are gonna populate the council with more individuals, and we're gonna have the first steering committee meeting on Monday where we're gonna talk about who all else on campus should be part of that council, and clearly we would not have the council without faculty members being involved in helping us make decisions. And so, I, again, I apologize, I don't think I was clear, uh, but certainly, you know, your, your voice is very well heard, heard and we, we definitely plan on having more people on that council. Uh, we all are hearing a great resurgence of manufacturing and that could have tremendous impact on the economy of Wisconsin. What are some of the initiatives as a university we are doing Mm -hmm. uh, in the resurgence of manufacturing, particularly in Wisconsin. Okay. So one of the things uh, that, again, is in, is in such preliminary stages that I cannot you know, really talk about it because it's, it's still so nebulous, but uh, one of the things that Chancellor Blank and I have talked about is actually having the two research universities go together in the next moment and ask for something substantial uh, for us to do research. And one of the natural things, obviously, uh, but would align well with the state of getting more funds to help uh, the manufacturing sector in Wisconsin be more successful. So I think as we're thinking down the line, in terms of if we're asking for something major for the research universities to do more research, you know, we want to align with what will help the state be more successful. Manufacturing seems like a logical one to me. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I do want to highlight that there are going to be a couple of, in the beginning part of the faculty senate, there are going to be a couple of uh, presentations by uh, my vice chancellor, or our vice chancellors, on updates and some issues that they're doing that I may not have covered in the plenary, so you may want to stick around for another 15 or 20 minutes to hear uh, what they have to say. So thank you. <laughs>